So welcome everybody to this presentation, this software demo on the European environment for scientific software installations, and or indeed easy for short. Um, I'll start with introducing myself. Um, so my name is Kenneth Hoste. I'm a computer scientist from Belgium. Um, I got my computer science degrees at Ghent University in Belgium. And since 2010, I'm also working there as an HPC system administrator. Um, I mostly take care of the user support aspects um, in the team. So I'm, I'm helping out researchers um, using our supercomputing facilities, helping out with any problems they may run into uh, or getting answers to their questions. And as a big part of that, I spend a lot of my time um, getting software installed on our system and trying to make sure that it works well um, on our computers. Um, I guess that makes me a research software engineer, but I'm not quite sure um, whether that fits the, the bill. I'm a big fan of open source software. Um, I have a wife and two kids, which I like uh, very much as well, obviously. I'm a big fan of loud music and a good beer and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but there's also things I don't like, um, and many of those are related to uh, the amount of time I spent in, in getting scientific software to install. Um, so things like C++ and OpenFoam, um, CMake are uh, slowly becoming my arch nemesis. Um, so yeah, those are things I don't really like. So the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations uh, is the topic of today's uh, talk and presentation and also demo. Um, so I'll talk about who is involved in the project, uh, what we are doing, what the project is about, and why we started the project. It's a fairly recent project. Um, it was started basically February of this year. Um, so it's, it's still quite new, but we've covered a, a lot of ground. We've done a lot of work since then. Um, and, and we're happy to show you uh, what we have come up with until now. Um, I'll talk a bit more of how we are solving uh, the problems that we want to solve, what the challenges are we are running into, and, and which open source software we are using to do that. And I'll also give an overview of the current status um, and then do a live demo. I'll do a short live demo somewhere in the middle of the talk and then a bit more um, at the end as time allows. So the easy project in a nutshell um, is again the European Environment for Scientific Software Installations. I hope that gives you some idea of what we're doing. Um, uh, it's easy for short, so double E double S I, and we pronounce that as easy. That's not an accident. Um, it's uh, the project is a collaboration between uh, various partners in the HPC community, and it's slowly growing. Um, so it's really a community project. And what we want to do is we want to build a common scientific software stack for HPC clusters um, or supercomputers, but not only that, but also um, cloud environments, personal workstations, laptops. Um, so we want to build a software stack that works on all of these uh, platforms. It's what I call a grassroots project, which uh, means that it was, it was started from the ground up, so to speak, um, by technical people who we're spending way too much time and still are spending way too much time and getting scientific software to, to install. Um, and they figured they wanted to work together to uh, come up with a better solution for this issue um, and hopefully win back some of the time they have been spending. So you can find us on GitHub. We have a website. Um, we have some documentation. Um, we have a Twitter account. So you can check us out on any of those links. The partners involved with the project, as I mentioned, are, are uh, expanding or are growing. Um, the project was started by um, several Dutch universities, which include Delft, Eindhoven, Twente, Amsterdam, and Groningen, um, together with Dell Technologies. So, so they were having um, meetings and they visited the University of Cambridge at some point. And from that, from those meetups, um, grew the idea to work together on something and they did a bit of a brainstorm and they quickly landed on the, the topic of um, installing software on their clusters. Um, I was invited to join their meeting and present the Easy Build project, which I'm, I'm one of the uh, lead developers of um, last February. And from them, I, I rolled into the project and I helped uh, build out what we have today. Gradually, uh, additional people or additional sites partners joined the project, so CERSARA, the National uh, Research Institute in the Netherlands, the Ulrich Supercomputing Center, University of Oslo, 
uh, the HPC Now consultancy company, and we're also getting some help and sponsorship from uh, both Azure and AWS. So that has been very really, uh, helpful and interesting. So the problem we are trying to tackle with the easy project is uh, I, I like to frame it as there's a storm coming. Um, so we, we see we're, we're running out of time or we don't have enough time to get scientific software installed in a proper way on, on our systems. Um, there's lots of scientific software. It's growing. It's, it's exploding almost. Things like bioinformatics, machine learning, uh, deep learning, all of these fields are quickly growing and quickly producing more and more uh, software that scientists want to use. Um, there's also an increasing variety in, in processors and, and CPUs that are used on, on HPC clusters. It used to be mostly Intel processors with a bit of others on the side in, in niche computers. Uh, but now AMD is back in the game. We're seeing the rise of ARM um, processors where the top supercomputer in, in Japan now is an ARM-based system. There's multiple other ones as well, like, uh, like Isambard in the UK and so on. Um, the IBM power processors have, are still around, have never been away really, and are still relevant. And there's also the RISC-V uh, open source processors that are, are getting a lot of attention and that are part of the European processor initiative. So that's yet another platform that's certainly coming um, sometime in the near future. On top of that, we have accelerators. So the well-known NVIDIA GPUs, AMD has GPUs now as well that are relevant for um, scientific computing. Intel has their own um, hardware for this coming up as well. Uh, we also see a rise of interest in, in cloud infrastructure. So Amazon, Microsoft um, certainly have um, HPC capable um, offerings there. And there's other clouds like Google and Oracle and um, lots of others I'm not mentioning here. So this is all growing, booming, expanding, increasing, um, and it's more and more becoming a problem for um, HPC support teams. So people who help out with scientific um, researchers getting their work done, um, they're quickly running out of time and helping them with, with all of this. Um, one of the big factors in, in high performance computing, HPC is the, the performance aspect. Um, um, and this is maybe often overlooked or, or may, maybe people are not aware enough of this issue. Um, so it, it's very important that the software you use, the scientific software you use on these systems is properly optimized for the system on which it will be running. Um, and here I have an example where I, I show Gromax um, running on one particular system, an Intel Cascade Lake system. So one of the uh, nodes in, in one of the clusters we have in Ghent. So the system is fixed, the hardware is fixed um, across the whole uh, graph and each bar in the graph shows a different Gromax installation. So the only way in which the Gromax installations are different is how they were compiled. So you're just running a different Gromax binary. The, the source code is exactly the same. The Gromax configuration is exactly the same. You're using the same job script. You're just running a different binary. Um, and if you're not careful, so if you're running a Gromax installation that's generically compiled, which basically runs on any sufficiently modern um, Intel or AMD CPU, you get about one nanosecond uh, per day of simulated time. So you can simulate one nanosecond in 24 hours of compute time. Um, is that good? Maybe, but if you properly recompile Gromax and do it in a way that you tell the compiler, I want to run this software on an Intel Cascade Lake system. So make sure you properly optimize it. You pro use the proper machine instructions. So you have these AVX 512 factor instructions and so on. You get 70% speed up. So that, that's quite impressive. You go from one nanosecond of simulated time in 24 hours to 1.85 nanoseconds. So you're almost doubling the, the simulation speed of your Chromax simulation. Um, so that's very important to um, keep this in mind and to, to be aware of this. So um, these are a couple of cartoons I like to show when, when I, I talk about topics like this, getting scientific software installed. Um, two of them are from the XKCD series that I'm sure many of you are aware of. Um, the, the, the key point here is that it, it's, it's telling that it's not difficult to find multiple cartoons that apply to this problem. So this is a problem that's very widespread even outside of scientific computing, uh, people see this issue. Um, and many are just trying to get along with their own scripting, um, 
work around spending lots of time, losing lots of time rather than getting signings done. So we, we can do better by collaborating, by tackling this as a community. So one of the remarks that usually pops up is what about containers? So have, haven't containers basically solved this issue already? Um, in, in my personal opinion, they have not. Um, so containers are very popular in, in HPC cluster since a couple of years, largely thanks to the Singularity project, um, which has made containers um, usable on HPC systems. Um, but they're still problematic in, in um, some aspects. So the integration with, with HPC system resources is still an issue. The interconnect, so the, the fast network you get um, for running big simulations, making sure that's properly used from a container is, is not that trivial. Um, properly using GPUs, and you have to be very careful. You can actually see and access the GPUs from a container image, let alone do it in, in an optimal way and so on. So that's, that's one aspect that's still not a solved problem in practice. Um, people that, that like containers a lot and, and the developers of container runtimes like to say they, they have native performance with containers, which is true in some sense, but what they really mean is that the containers have very little overhead. So you're not losing time because your software is packed in a container. That's certainly true, and there's not lots of papers that have shown this, but that's a, a base requirement for HPC. Um, so if you don't have that, you're not even relevant. But it's not enough to just do that. You need to do more. Um, something that's very important is that you need to uh, use a container image that's properly optimized, like the, the graph I was showing before. Um, so you, you need to make sure you're using um, a software compilation binaries that is targeting the hardware on which you will be running. And this sort of clashes with what containers are meant for. Containers are, uh, you, you pack the software once in a container image and you copy it around everywhere and you just can go ahead and run and everything nicely works. It, it usually runs, it usually works, but you're paying for that in performance. So there's this trade-off between performance and mobility of compute. Um, and then somebody also needs to create the container image that you need. So if you want to run Gromax and TensorFlow and OpenFoam and a single research project, somebody has to create that container image that contains all of that and ideally also properly optimized for the hardware in which you will be running it. Um, if somebody gives you a container image that was built for an Intel processor, it will not run on ARM system and the other way around. So that's another complication where the increase in variety of CPUs um, is certainly going to be an issue. So I'd like to summarize this with containers are a symptom, not a cure. So they're, they're a sign that there's, there's problems, um, but they're a workaround. So they're not really a, really a solution to the issues we're seeing. So what we want to do in the easy project is, is tackle these problems. Um, we want to build a shared repository, a shared collection of, of scientific software installations. We want to do this as a community, so not uh, one company or one site doing this by themselves and hoping that others will use it. Then we want to collaborate together, help each other out, share expertise, um, look at this issue together. We want to provide a uniform way um, for researchers to use the software. So when, wherever they are running it on, whether it's on their laptop or it's on an HPC cluster or it's in a cloud instance, they should be able to use the same workflow, use the same job scripts and not really change anything ideally. Um, we want to make sure it runs on Linux, Linux, Mac OS and Windows. So whatever you are using as operating system, um, that should be largely irrelevant. We want to support different types of CPUs, Intel, AMD, all these different generations, different ARM processors, power, maybe eventually RISC-V as well. We want to take into account the fast interconnect. So if you have an InfiniBand cluster that the software is properly using it, uh, be aware of GPUs, of course, um, different generations of GPUs, AMD, NVIDIA, all of that. And of course, since this is an, a, a project that grew from an HPC community, there's a lot of focus on the performance of the installations. Uh, we want to make sure that the, the deployment of these installations is as automated as possible. It's well tested. Um, we can tune things, we can check the performance and make sure um, things keep performing well as we go forward and so on. So it, in summary, it's a very ambitious project. It's a, it's a big thing, um, but we're convinced we can make this happen and I will explain you how we can do that. So before I, I detail some more of the uh, inner workings of the project and what we have done up until now, um, I would like you to help me pick a live demo for the end of the talk. 
So I've prepared four scientific applications. There's Gromax, so molecular dynamic simulation. Um, there's TensorFlow, which you probably know, so machine learning, deep learning. Um, uh, there's open foam for computational fluid dynamics, and there's bioconductor, which does uh, bioinformatics stuff, DNA analysis, and so on. Uh, so you see the poll popping up um, already. So there's a software part to the poll. There's also a, a hardware part. Um, so the second part of the poll is uh, you can pick on which platform I will be using this software. So any of those four, I can run on either my Raspberry Pi cluster, which is sitting in my living room. So that's a four node Raspberry Pi cluster, um, which has ARM CPUs. Um, I can do it in, in AWS in the cloud. So that's also an ARM Graviton 2, so a more capable ARM um, CPU. Or I can do it in Azure, which, where I will uh, pick an Intel uh, Xeon VM. Something It will give me something that I don't really know what I will get in Intel Haswell or something more recent. Um, or I can do it on our own HPC UGAND cluster, which has AMD Rome CPUs. So it's up to you what you pick. Um, I'll, I'll leave it up to you for the end of the talk. Uh, what I will do already, so I, I will take one of the combinations here, um, and I'll show you how you can run Gromax on a Raspberry Pi cluster, uh, because that's one of the more fun ones, and it's relatively short in terms of runtime. So I'll switch to a terminal here, actually four terminals. Um, so the bigger terminal on the left is my head node of my Raspberry Pi cluster, um, which should hopefully still be active, yes. And the ones on the right, so have three ones, three smaller terminals running here. These are just running HTOP, so they are showing how active the Raspberry Pis are. So the four cores on each three of those and also the head node are idle, they're not doing much. So what I will do, this is basically empty Raspberry Pis. They have a 64-bit operating system, Raspberry Pi OS, so that's pretty standard. And I've added one additional software package, which I had to build from source because it's, on, it's an ARM thing, which is CERN VMFS, and I'll explain a bit later what that does. So, it's a bare bones um, operating system only with certain VMFS installed in, on top. What that gives me is this gives me this uh, file system, additional file system I have here, uh, which may be a bit slow to talk to at first, but it should come through eventually. Um, so I have stuff in here, I have directories in here. I will explain throughout the presentation what this all means. I have software in here and other stuff, what I will do is I will source this initialization script. This will set up my environment to start using the easy file repository. You can see things here, like it has detected somehow that I have an Arch 64, an, AMD, an ARM 64-bit um, CPU on my, in my Raspberry Pi, so that's very good. And it's doing a bunch of magic. What it's basically doing is making sure I have software available, like, for example, Gromax. So if I run the module avail command, which I'll explain a bit more as well, hopefully you're familiar with this already, um, it gives me an answer that says, okay, I have a Gromax installation for you that you can start playing with. There's other stuff here as well. Um, all of the ones I mentioned, Bioconductor, OpenFoam, um, for these, there are modules available here uh, too. What I'll do now, so I have self-picked the Gromax demo, so which I have prepared here. These demos are also available in, in the GitHub repository, which I'll mention later in the slide. So you can play with this yourself if you want to. And I have a small script here, run MPI, 100 steps. This will just load the Gromax module, the one I showed, clean stuff up a bit, well, which is not relevant here. And it will do an MPI run, so it will start a Gromax simulation with MPI. So this is the Gromax binary it will be running. This is the list of, um, hosts or nodes it can use. So that's just my four Raspberry Pis that are listed here. And when I run this script, um, this should fire up Gromax. It can be a, a bit slow initially um, because in the background, it's basically pulling in the software um, that I want to use. So Gromax is not installed on this actually on this cluster. It's actually sitting in a server in, in Groningen in the Netherlands. And it's basically pulling down the software as it needs it. Then it starts running Gromax. And you can see the three Raspberry Pis here, the three other nodes starting to go green. So all the cores are starting to run um, this Gromax simulation. So they're helping out with the Gromax simulation. And it's really as simple as this. So you get an almost um, empty Linux installation. You install this CERN VMFS thing on it, which I'll explain. And then you can start doing science with Gromax, OpenFoam, 
um, all this other stuff that's on here. So that's just one of the demos. I'll let this run. It will take a while, a couple of minutes, because you can't get a lot of science done with, with, uh, with uh, Raspberry Pis. Uh, you have to be a bit patient. So how does this all work? Um, so what we do in the EC project is we basically combine multiple open source projects together to make something big or something very capable. Um, so the one of the very important projects is CERN VMFS, which I already mentioned, which is a software distribution service project. That, that sounds a bit vague, but what it basically does is it allows you to, to build a file system. So a set of directories, set of files that you can share around the world. Um, so anyone who has access to the internet can get access to these software installations. It's, it all goes over HTTP, so it's very firewall friendly. Um, basically, you can use it from anywhere, from your laptop, from an HPC cluster, from a cloud environment. You can access it. And it's built such that it scales. So even if there's thousands of clients accessing your uh, file system, um, it just all work, works nicely. And clients only get read-only access, so they cannot add stuff to the file system. They can only read stuff from it. So that's one of the core components here. Um, other things we're using is the gentle Linux um, distribution, uh, where you usually install um, software packages from source. We're not using this for installing things like Chromax or, or OpenFOAM, so not for scientific software, but we use it to build a middle layer where um, we can basically make sure that the software we install on top of that is compatible with any client. So whether you're using running Linux Ubuntu or Fedora, CentOS, Debian, um, eventually also Mac OS, um, that will work. And if you're using Windows, you can use the Windows subsystem for Linux, which is a Linux VM in the Windows environment. Um, that's good enough as well. So all this variety of clients, we basically um, built a layer on top of that, and then we know uh, what we are dealing with and it all works nicely. Um, there's three more projects here that, which have the same uh, colored box. So that's easy build, Elmod and Archpack. Uh, we combine these three to build another layer on top of the, the Gen2 layer. So with easy build, we install a whole bunch of scientific software like Gromax, OpenFoam. All of these are compiled from source typically with easy build, uh, which already has a large collection of software it supports. And what EasyBuild does by default is it will optimize for the host on which the software is being compiled. So if you're compiling on an Intel Haswell system, it will optimize the software for that system. So going back to the Gromax graph uh, with the different performance I showed, EasyBuild does the proper thing. It will build the software for the system on which it will be running. Um, and you can exploit that. What EasyBuild also does, it will generate um, these module files, environment module files. Um, and you can give these files to another tool called LMOD. So when I was running the module avail command or the module load command I was showing in the job script, I was basically using LMOD. So LMOD consumes these small text files which describe how to activate software. So how to change your environment so it becomes uh, usable uh, to use it. That's a fairly intuitive way to give access to lots of different software installations, whether you wanna use OpenFORM or Gromax or TensorFlow, it doesn't matter, you just do module load name of the software, maybe with the version attached, and magic happens in the background and suddenly that software becomes available. You can start running it. Um, it also allows us to install multiple versions of the same software side by side. So if you check what we have now in our easy repository, you will see two different versions of OpenFOAM because OpenFOAM is, is like split up into several um, forks. So they have different versions, different variants of the same software. And we can install all of those side by side without any issues. Um, the middle one, Archpack, is a small Python library. Um, this is fairly new. It has only been around for uh, less than a year. Um, it was open sourced uh, or actually pulled out of an other project um, last January. But this is a small Python library that can automatically detect what kind of CPU you have in your system. Um, so whether it's ARM or x86, but also whether it's an Intel Haswell or an, an ARM Graviton um, CPU. And it can also compare um, different CPUs of the same family together. So it can, it knows whether an Intel Skylake is newer than an Intel Haswell, and it knows what is compatible with what. And we can exploit that to fully automatically um, do things so a human doesn't have to pick between all these um, different in installations. Um, eventually, we'll also use the Reframe project, which is a, 
a testing tool for HPC clusters, so for software on HPC clusters. Uh, you can sort of compare it with, with something like PyTest where you uh, implement tests in, in Python code and then you give it to Reframe and Reframe knows what to, what to do with it. It will not only run the test and check if they're uh, properly running, but it, it will also check on performance. You can give it uh, bounds. You can tell it this thing has to run between one hour and two hours. If it takes longer, then it's too slow and something's wrong. If it's way faster than one hour, then that's very fishy and I, you want to know about this as well. So you can take a closer look what's actually going on. Um, we combine all these things in this um, layered um, design of the project. So the bottom layer, the file system layer is what I was showing um, interactively in the terminal. So that's with, where we use certain VMFS. That's basically just to distribute the software we, we provide. Uh, the compatibility layer is where we use Gen2. So this is leveling the, the ground across the different types of clients we support. And then on top, we have the software layer, the actual scientific applications installed with EasyBuild, including all of their dependencies and so on. And there's, this is where we also use ArchPick and Elma. Okay, um, the idea behind the Easy project is not new. Um, so we didn't actually come up with this. Uh, we uh, very closely looked at what Compute Canada has done. Um, so they basically have the same um, concept of this layered um, organization um, to build a common software stack for all the bigger uh, supercomputers in Canada. So they have five big systems in Canada, uh, plus a whole bunch of smaller ones. And uh, uh, all, or at least most of them are, are using these shared software stacks. So they have one single software stack for all of their systems. Um, we took a close look at what they did. We're also in close touch with the people at Compute Canada. Um, we're learning from their mistakes. We're seeing how they did things and uh, double checking whether uh, there's maybe now a better approach for it. Um, they were, for the middle layer, they are using Gen2 prefix now. They were using another tool called Nix before, uh, which gave them some issues. Um, so we're learning from, uh, well, not mistake, but we, we're learning from what they have discovered. Um, so we're also using Gen2 prefix. They're using Easybuild and Elmod for the software layer. And, and here we added the ArchPack component, which is, a, which is a new addition in the, in the design. Um, they have, uh, written a paper and presented that at the PER conference last year. They've given talks about this even at the Easybuild user meeting last year. And so we're in close touch with the people at Compute Canada. And the first thing we try to do is to figure out whether we could join forces with them um, and basically take what they have and try to get it uh, usable for other sites. Uh, after discussing that a bit, both sides agreed that it's probably not the best way forward. So it would be difficult for us to jump into their project where they already have made lots of design decisions and it will be difficult for them to open it up to other sites uh, and making sure additional software can be added by request and things like this. So we basically started from scratch, learning from what they have learned and with their input, um, and we're trying to uh, open it up to the, the wider community. So not just Compute Canada. Um, then back to easy. So this is an overview of the easy network that we have. So this is how we distribute the software basically around the world. Um, so this is sort of how CERN VMFS works in the background. So there's a lot of technical detail here, but um, CERN VMFS has a one central server, the Stratum Zero. So this is where the actual software gets installed, gets added. This is the only place you have right access to um, what is provided. and uh, connected to the Stratum Zero, you have Stratum One servers, so where which help basically with the distribution, with the uh, scalability of the network. And whenever somebody who wants to access the software um, uses a system, whether it's a laptop, a personal workstation, a cloud, an HPC cluster, they somehow connect to one of these Stratum One servers and they pull in the software on demand um, as it is uh, needed. So the key message here is, well, there's a couple of key messages. So we, we heavily rely on certain VMFS to do this, which is very scalable, very reliable. Um, so this has this project has been around for um, well over a decade now. And it's used by the, the CERN um, Research um, Institute, so where they have the Large Hadron Collider, the, the particle accelerator. They've been using this for years to basically do the same thing, distribute software um, across a whole bunch of systems. Um, the distribution is done over HTTP, so it's very firewall friendly. It passes through everywhere. It's 
basically web servers that are serving the software. And the key thing here is that wherever you are, you can get access to the same software stack. Um, so you see the same file system, the same files from everywhere. The compatibility layer, so this is the middle layer of the design um, is where we use Gen2 prefix. So we use this to install a limited set of tools and libraries in a non-standard location. So we pick a directory, which is basically the one shown here below. So slash EVMFS, name of our repository, maybe a version. Um, and we basically installed a small Linux distribution in there. Uh, so uh, below these directories, you would have user bin, user lib, and so on. Um, we use Gentoo for this because Gentoo has a project, a sub project called Gentoo Prefix, um, which allows this. So you can basically install a, a Linux distribution outside of the standard slash location. You can install it in any directory you want. Um, so that's why we use Gentoo Prefix. And we have two directories here, one for ARM based processors, one for x86 based processors, because you cannot run something that was compiled for x86 on ARM and the other way around. So we need this split um for all types of processors we will support eventually we will probably have a power and a risk 5 directory um, in here as well and again we use this compatibility layer to level the ground between the different um, types of operating systems we support and then the software layer on top um, that's where the actual scientific applications live the libraries and their dependencies um, here we optimize the installations for specific CPU microarchitectures. So for Intel Haswell and Intel Skylake separate. So we have separate installations for each of these uh, types of CPUs or generations of CPUs. And we leverage what we get from the compatibility layer. So a library like glibc, for example, we only use from the compatibility layer, not from the host OS, because that way we can make sure the software will run on any uh, Linux or Mac OS distribution eventually. Um, again, we use EasyBuild to install the software here. We use the LMOD tool to provide access to it, to these installations through the modules. Um, and we use the ArchPack library to help us figure out the best subdirectory, so the best part of the software stack for a particular host. And this is fully automatic. So uh, as I shown before, when you source a script, it detects which, which CPU you have, and it says, OK, on this system, I can give you this software stack, and everything will work nicely and fast. The current status of the project is we've we've covered quite a bit of ground in the last couple of months. Um, so we've been working together on GitHub um, to build uh, build up this idea. We have a Stratum Zero server running at the University of Groningen, so that's where the software is actually served from. And then we have two Stratum One servers, so which help build this uh, network, this reliable, scalable network. One in Groningen, one in Oslo. Um, we have the compatibility layer installed with Gen2 prefix, both for x86 and ARM CPUs. Um, currently, we only support Linux, so not Mac OS yet, but we're, we're looking into that. Um, we have a whole bunch of software installed already. Um, so we have Bioconductor, uh, Gromax, OpenFoam, TensorFlow, and all the dependencies they require, which includes things like R and Python and all of these things. Now we have different hardware targets we support, like Intel Haswell and Intel Skylake, so very specific CPUs. Also AMD Rome or AMD Zen 2. Um, and we have a fallback installation to any x86 64-bit CPU and any 64-bit ARM CPU. And that was the one that was being used on the Raspberry Pis. If you want to try this out yourself, so if you don't believe me that this is working, um, we have the documentation here. You can just uh, follow this link and follow the instructions and you will get access to all of this installation, all of this software in a matter of minutes. So to give you a, a better idea of, of how to get access to it, it's really from, from scratch almost um, to scientific installations and, and simulations in three easy steps. Um, so the first one is getting access to the software. So for this, you need CVMFS um, or certain VMFS. So either you install that yourself um, natively, but then you require admin privileges. So you need to do um, access on the Linux system you're using to do that. Um, and you can find the instructions here or uh, also in our documentation and in the scripts included in the easy demo um, repository. Or you can just use a singularity container. And for this, you don't need any admin rights at all. Um, as long as you have singularity installed, you can get direct access to our repository 
um, no, no tricks or nothing special. So on any HPC cluster that has a recent installation of Singularity, you can get access immediately to all of this. This has some more technical details on how to do that. So which packages you need to install to get CVMFS running and properly configured so it can access our, um, our system. You need to create a small configuration file which tells it to bypass proxies. So to talk to the Stratum 1 servers directly and how much disk space it can use to pull in the software. So in this case, 10 gigabytes. But once you have all of that installed and you run CVMFS setup, CVMFS config setup, uh, that's all you need to do to get access to the file system. Uh, if you don't have sudo writes, you can use Singularity. Um, the top part of the, of the uh, commands here are just configuration. Um, so you can read up on the details if you want to. But what it boils down to is that you run a Singularity shell command with some fuse mount options, and you give it a Docker image, which is the one we have here parked on Docker Hub, um, which works both on ARM and x86. So you just Singularity shell, you uh, get an environment in the container and you can access the, um, the file system we provide. Once you have access to uh, uh, our easy repository, you source the script like I showed during the demo. Um, it's the same script, no matter which hardware or uh, operating system you're using. It auto detects which CPU you have and it does the right thing in the background. And then uh, um, it gives you a new environment where you can start playing around using the software you want, or maybe checking what changes it has made in the environment. And once you've done that, you can get access to the software. So you can check which modules are available. You can load those modules and you can start running um, the simulations or the analysis you want to do. And now I hope we still have time for some more demos. Um, so maybe Alison, if you can share the result of the poll, that would be nice. And maybe we need a drum roll for that to see what kind of trouble I will be getting myself into. Yeah. I think you can now see them. Yeah, okay. So we're, I'm seeing that 42% of people want me to show TensorFlow and OpenFoam is second place, okay. And surprise, surprise, the Raspberry Pi cluster is the more popular one. And the next one is the Graviton 2 in Amazon. Okay, so what I'll do is, uh, let me see. Let me show you TensorFlow on the Raspberry Pi cluster, just to show you what works because it does. And then maybe I'll um, also show OpenFoam on the Graviton in, in EC2. So that seems fair. Um, to do that, um, I will start the, the cloud instance first. Um, so this is EC2. I will lo launch a new VM to really show you that I'm starting from scratch. There's absolutely nothing um, on that OS. I will pick 64-bit ARM um, and select an instance here. So we're running OpenFoam and it has to be a little bit big. So we have a fair amount of memory. I will use this one, which has 16 cores and 32 gigabytes of RAM. Um, that should be enough. Just need to make sure I have enough storage here. So if it pulls in some software that things don't fall over and I will launch this, I will give it my SSH key and tell it to go and start that VM. So that's now starting in the background. It will take a little bit of time. I can switch back to the Raspberry Pi cluster, which has completed the Gromax installation, uh, the Gromax run rather in about three minutes. So it did 1.30, uh, 0 0.13 nanoseconds per day, which is, if you take into account the graph, which is going to close to two, it's pretty terrible, uh, but it did run the simulation. So that's pretty good. Um, let me go back to the TensorFlow example I have here. So I have this also prepared. Um, this is a small Python script, which I pulled from um, the TensorFlow quick start. So this downloads some um, MNIST data. So this is uh, handwritten digits, I think on which it will be doing uh, recognition. So which digits were written. Um, it's a very small Python script and you can find it in the uh, repository here um, if you want to play with that yourself. And the run script is very trivial as well. I will just load the module for the TensorFlow installation we have and then do Python and the Python script and I will time it to see how long that takes. I will just run this. The environment here, as I showed before, is already prepared. Let me maybe show you if I do module tensorflow, 
it will tell me um, I have this exact uh, TensorFlow module installed. There it goes. This is a, a single node uh, run. So I'm not doing MPI or anything here. So the other, uh, other Raspberry Pis will be sitting around doing nothing. I'll just run this. Um, and again, in the background, this is going to pull in all the software that I, I need. So not only TensorFlow itself, but also the Python installation, all of the dependencies that it has, um, that it needs to, to start the simulation. It will pull that in in the background. So I'm not doing anything else here. CVMFS is doing all of that for me. Um, and I can maybe even show you that. Uh, yeah, so this is um, HTOP running on this um, head node where I started the TensorFlow run. And you can see CVMFS going doing all sorts of stuff here. So it's pulling in um, all the installations in the background. This will take a little while. TensorFlow has a lot of dependencies, um, lots of small Python packages and uh, other tools it needs to run. So eventually this will start the actual simulation. So at, at first, this is a bit slow, uh, but if you start a second TensorFlow simulation, it will just start instantly because everything is already downloaded. It already has the software it needs uh, locally. So it's done doing that. Um, TensorFlow is complaining there's not enough free memory. It's a Raspberry Pi with one gigabyte of RAM, so no surprise. But it is running the simulation or the um, the analysis in this case. So it's training a neural network and it's trying to recognize the digits. Um, so again, this will take a couple of minutes. It's a Raspberry Pi, no surprise. But I can go back to um, AWS, check the IP address of this instance here, which is all I need. Okay, this one, let me pull up another terminal window in here. So if everything is right, all I need to do is use this, the correct account name and the right IP address. It knows about my SSH keys already, so I can just log in. And here we're on, so check proxy P info, this is an ARM-based system, which is well not very easy to tell. Um, this is an ARM-based CPU. So I don't have any software installed here, nothing at all. This is a bare operating system. Um, what I will do on this particular instance, I will use Singularity because if I need to uh, use CVMFS, I have to compile it from source on an ARM system. So I don't want to spend the time doing that here. Um, so what I will do is I will copy paste basically what I had in the slides, which prepares um, a bunch of environment variables, and then basically does a singularity shell of a Docker image I have on Docker Hub. Oh, and of course, I need to install singularity first. Uh, like I told you, there's nothing here, not even singularity. Installing singularity is just downloading an RPM and then doing a yum install. So that's the only requirement we have here. This shouldn't take too long, hopefully. Let me check back on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, this one is. Uh, has completed the TensorFlow run in between. So that seemed to be going well. And it had 97% accuracy, which is, I guess, not bad. So uh, Singularity installed. We can do the Singularity shell again. Um, so this will pull in the Docker container from Docker Hub. So this takes a little while, but it will only do that once and we'll cache it locally. Um, so this is a bit of downloading and then a bit of conversion to make it a singularity container. It gives some scary warnings here about rootless and permissions thing, but this is a documented known issue, which is harmless. It even mentions it is harmless. Um, okay, so this gives us a shell in the container. And here, if everything is right, we should have our known CVMFS already available. We can do the same thing as I did before, which is source our init script. So same thing, no matter where you are, you source the init script. Um, thanks to Archpack, this will detect um, that I'm on a Graviton2 instance. So again, this takes a little while at first because CVMFS is pulling in basically the compatibility layer, which, which is where Archpack is installed. It will pull in the Python, it needs to run that. It has done the detection on Graviton2. So now it's setting up LMOD. It's making sure it has access to the modules. So that's a little bit slower than on the Raspberry Pi where everything was already pre-cached. Uh, but if we do this again, it will be a lot faster. And here, what was the one we wanted to use? I think it was OpenFoam. 
So we do have OpenFoam installed. We actually have two versions of OpenFoam installed. So it's the first time I'm accessing the module. So again, it's pulling in um, all those small module files over CVMFS. So initially it's a little bit slow. And like it says here, it doesn't have a cache for LMOD, which is also partially why it's slow, but it does have the LMOD installation, uh, the OpenFoam installation available. Now, let me uh, take that IP address again and copy over the demo I've prepared. So I'm doing that on the side here in a different terminal. I'm just copying the, the, the Git repository that I showed on the slides and it should be showing up here. Um, if everything is okay. Okay, so this is showing up here. I have easy demo. I'll let it do the copy first, which takes a little while. It hasn't copied the open phone part yet. So it's working on that. Meanwhile, while, while this is copying over and I'll, I'll start the simulation, the open foam um, simulation I have prepared. Maybe we already have um, some questions, Alison. Uh, yeah, we have quite a few. Um, I think some of your uh, colleagues on Easy have been answering some of them in the chat already. Um, okay. So I'll pick out a few that I don't think have been answered yet. Um, Be before we do that, let me just show you. So this has uh, uploaded now. I have a big run script here. I'm not going to step uh, through this, but this is running one of the open foam tutorial cases, which is looking at how um, air flows around the motorbike. So I'll just run this script. And again, it will take a little while to wake up and pull in all the software, but it should start showing open foam stuff. And I think it will run in a couple of minutes. It should complete the simulation. Uh, I have maybe, while well, that's running in the background, I'll get back to it, I promise. It's already starting, so you can see it's doing things. Um, I have two more slides, uh, where one is an important one. Yeah, so you can see we, we already have things working. Um, we have some applications that we picked and which seem to be working well, um, but there's a lot of lot more work here um, to do. So we have this pilot repository where you can start playing around yourself. Um, we're trying to do monthly revisions of this. So that's the version you've been seeing. 2020.10 is the last revision we've done. And we're uh, trying to find time to work on the next revision. Uh, we're identifying problems as we go. So sometimes thing don't, things don't work as expected and we try to figure out what the best ways of fixing them. Um, we're working on automating, automating the, the deployment of these different layers. So the compatibility layer and the software layer. What we eventually want to work towards is that somebody can send us a pull request on GitHub to add a new software package or a new version of the software package. And once we agree with that and we merge the, the pull request, then um, automatically um, maybe an instance is started in, in, in the cloud somewhere, which does the actual installation and then tells um, the Stratum Zero server, um, I have something new for you here, please include it. And everything works magically and automatic. Um, we're not there yet, but we're, we're working towards that. Uh, we want to do a lot better at testing things. So the things I'm showing uh, are working, but we want to have automated tests as well, maybe even running in GitHub Actions. So running a very, very small open foam simulation to just show that it's actually working. Um, we also hope that we can work together with the developers of scientific software, which may include some of the people here, um, to not only get their um, software into this uh, environment, but also help us with validating the installation. So the, the people who develop the software are, are best suited to know that it's properly installed and that it has all the bells and whistles it can have. Uh, we want to support Mac OS, power CPUs, GPUs, which are very important eventually, and add more software and hopefully also get some more uh, help, some more manpower on this and make it a funded project, which it currently is, isn't. Um, and that way we can work towards a production setup. The last slide I have is just a bunch of links to get more information. Uh, so feel free to contact us. Uh, we have a Slack channel as well, which you, if you follow the join link on our website, um, we will get you added in there and also to our mailing list. And yeah, you can get more information at, at all of these links, or you can contact me directly um, if you have any questions. And meanwhile, Open Foam is running in the background. Uh, I think it does 500 time steps, so it's close to finishing. And I hope we still have some time for questions. 
Uh, yeah, we've got about five minutes left. Um, so I'll pick out a few of the questions um, that have been asked. Um, and then if people want to hang around and ask uh, kind of more questions after four o'clock, then um, we'll stop the recording and people we can have a more informal chat then. Um, so um, we've got, had a couple of people asking about dependencies on proprietary resources. Uh, for example, Intel um, NVIDIA CUDA stack, sorry, Intel MKL, NVIDIA CUDA, uh, CUDNN, NCLL, um, because as the question understands it, the licenses of those resources means they, they can't be redistributed. Do you have any, um, have you have you had any thoughts about how you might deal with that? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. That's a problem Compute Canada has run into as well. Um, so what they have done is they, they've taken a look at the licenses. I think for CUDA, it's actually not a problem. Um, so with CUDA, you, you're actually allowed to, to copy it and redistribute it to others. Um, so there's no, there's no licensing there. You're not, yeah, you, you cannot um, disassemble their code and, and start stealing their source code or anything like that. But copying the binaries around is apparently not a problem. We're not doing that here yet. We're, we haven't looked into GPUs. Um, but we know it's not a problem for Compute Canada, so it should be not a problem for us as well. The Intel compilers, Intel tools are a little bit more complicated. So Intel compilers were not actually allowed to redistribute at all, um, but we can redistribute the runtime libraries. So if we compile software with Intel compilers, we can um, only provide the libraries that you need to run that software. That's okay, but we cannot redistribute the compilers themselves. Um, and that's maybe at some point we will engage that discussion with Intel and say, look, we have all the software here, but yours is missing because of this uh, licensing restriction we have. And we're hoping that maybe they can change their mind in the long run, because even if you have the Intel compilers installed, it's not enough to use them. You still need a, a license and a license server to talk to, um, to actually run them. So hopefully that may that may convince them. And actually, Intel compilers are included in things like OpenHPC through some mechanism. So there are ways around their, their licensing. But the answer depends on, on the software, of course. So for something like MATLAB, um, it's a lot more difficult. Um, ANSYS software, so uh, Fluent and all these things um, is also very, very difficult. And we hope eventually to, to be able to engage the discussion with, with the vendors of the software to convince them like, yeah, if your software is not here, then people will start using other software uh, because it's, it's so easy to use. Uh, so we're, we're really lowering um, the threshold to adoption here. So we hope to convince them as well to change their mind or at least allow us to include their software in here. Thank you. Um, so the question, um, what, as what aspect of the project marks the starkest difference with, for example, SPAC? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, so SPAC is very similar to uh, EasyBuild. It's a tool you and you use to install software from source. Um, so here, with, with using our environment, you don't have to install software from source anymore. It's already done for you. So you don't need EasyBuild or SPAC if you don't want to add additional stuff. Um, SPAC does have um, uh, is a component in a project that's somewhat similar to this. Um, in the Exascale for Science project, they basically build a whole bunch of binary packages that you can easily install on a supercomputer or on your laptop. So um, in terms of motivation, it's similar, but the approach is very different. Um, so with the packages they provide, you still have to install the packages. Uh, you have to figure out how to combine things. Uh, while with our environment, you just check what's there. Um, and whatever is there, you can use straight away. You don't have to install anything additional. Um, so the, the step towards using it is a lot smaller, I would say. Uh, compared to E4S. There's lots of differences there, lots of yes, but, and what in this case. Um, but yeah, there's similar, but different projects, both Easy Build and SPAC and E4S and Easy. Um, yeah, have, have some important differences. Thank you. Uh, I have time for one more question. Um, question saying, uh, given the diversity of software used by different research disciplines, um, who decides what software will be installed in the easy software repository? Okay, yeah, it's a very good question. Hopefully, uh, right now we're not really there yet, I would say. So we, we picked some software that we know is troublesome for people to install like OpenFoam um, or like TensorFlow when you want to properly optimize it and build it from source. It's, it's, a, it's half a nightmare to do that. Um, so now they were like handpicked. Um, but eventually we want to grow towards something that the community decides what should go in there. So people send us pull requests 
um, hopefully we can get lots of help with reviewing and merging these pull requests. And whenever it's something open source and, and easy to install on these different types of architectures, and maybe even if it's not, so we can ex exclude, for example, complex software on ARM if it's not compatible with that, uh, we'll just go ahead and install it. Um, so there's actually, other than disk space, there's no real limitation we have in terms of what we can uh, get installed. All these things can live side by side next to each other uh, and people just load the modules they are interested in. So in that, that way, there's no real restriction. Right now, we, we don't have things set up yet to have this community engagement and allow people to um, easily um, propose software to add. So it's a bit of a manual process right now. Um, but yeah, we're, we will work towards that. And if people are, are interested in having something added into the pilot stack and they're willing to work actively with us on that, then they, they can definitely let us know and we can see what, what we can easily set up. Thank you. Um, I think that's um, all the time we have for the formal Q&A. But as I say, if you'd like to ask kind of a question, I think he's able to hang around uh, for a little bit longer. Um, but I think we'll end the, the formal session and the recording now. So can we all just thank Kenneth very, very much um, for, for his demo today? Um, if we can use a Zoom reactions or clap or whatever you'd like. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Kenneth. Thank you. I'm going to stop Bye -bye. the recording now.